All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Lasting Learning Podcast. This week, we have an absolutely amazing guest joining us. We've got a guest who um, truly it inspires the crap out of me. This is a guy <laughs> who is doing all the things that I wish I could do with my life, and he does them all with such grace and humility and with a smile. He is just an absolutely incredible family man and father with five kids. Yeah, you heard that right. Five kids. And we'll, we're going to talk about that quite a bit. He is a school administrator. He is a, a podcaster and he is now in charge of an entire podcast network that we'll talk about. He is an author with a soon to be released book. It's in the pipeline. And again, just doing all of the things so well. Like he, you never hear him pumping himself up. You never hear him shouting his name from the rooftops. But today I'm going to. I am just in complete awe of having Joshua Stamper on the podcast today. Josh, thanks so much for being here, man. Man, Dave, what an intro. I just need to bring <laughs> you with me everywhere. Let's do it. Let's do it, man. I'll, I'll move to Texas tomorrow. <laughs> Let's hey, do it. It was almost 90 degrees today. You would have loved it. Oh, man. That's awesome. And you know that intro, it is 100% true. I am in awe of not just what you do, but how you carry yourself when you do all the things that you do. And, you know, I just hit the surface of some of the things that you do. Can you just break down who you are as a person a little bit more for those people that might not have ever connected with all of those things before? Sure. I mean, you laid it out perfectly. I, I'm a happily married man to an amazing woman. Um, we've been married for 17 years. Um, I've got five kids, two biological, three adopted. Um, it is never a dual a dull day in our household. It's, it's loud and obnoxious and I love every second of it. Um, I've got four boys and one girl. Um, my oldest is mama number two. She's amazing and um, kind of wrangles them all in. And then the four boys have lots of energy and um, I just love it, man. I'm like you said, I'm a family man. Every you know second I can, I, I try and be around them. But uh, of course I've got passions in other areas too, which <laughs> coincides with the administration part and education, um, of course, I'm trying to write a book, I'm trying to share with others. And then of course, the podcast, the Aspire podcast that I do, just trying to, you know, fill the cup of other aspiring leaders and, and help them through their journey. Uh, so good. So I'm, I'm going to say something right now to kind of incriminate myself and some other people. So I'm going to throw a bunch of other people under the bus with me. I'm not going alone. But I, I've had guests on before. I've had a lot of um, female leaders on my show who have kids and are busy. And I asked the question, you know, how do you maintain balance? And I always feel like I'm a sexist by asking that question to these, to the women, because it, I know it, come, it could come across to some people as though, why, why does she have to maintain balance? Why can't she mm -hmm. be a professional and be a mom and be a, a wife? I, I got to ask that question to you, man, because honestly, I've got four kids and I think I am exhausted all the time. I just think I am running myself ragged, but you've got five and you foster kids as well. Mm -hmm. And you've got these side hustles and you do uh, school administration. How in the world do you fit all this stuff into the package that is your life? Well, when I talk about the incredible wife, that, that's truly what I have. I, I couldn't do anything without her. And she is by far the backbone of our household. And, um, you know, the foster care and, and the adoption, all that, um, we couldn't do any of that. I couldn't do any of that without her. Um, you know, it's almost a part-time job in itself, just the paperwork and, um, you know, the visits that we have, the doctor's appointments. I mean, she does so many um, things with the kids that are above and beyond. And, and without her, I wouldn't be able to do a lot of the other things, you know, the long nights in administration, you know, the uh, admin on duty <laughs> stuff, the, you know, uh, writing the book, being on this podcast, you know, I'm on other podcasts too, not only my own. So, um, you know, the balance comes with, with having her um, kind of stepping in when I can't and then vice versa, because she is a nurse. She works too, so um, she works at nights. Um, so we, we balance each other out as far as our work schedules. So that way somebody's home with the kids at all times. But honestly, uh, without her, I couldn't do any of this. Well, is that how it works out for the two of you guys? Just because you're two ships passing in the night, you don't ever get to see each other. So you can't roll your eyes and huff and puff <laughs> and complain. You just have to buck it up and do it. Or, or, or do you truly love the life that you're presenting? Because that's the mm -hmm. thing about you, man. You, you come across so soft-spoken, so humble, and just so happy and proud of the life you're living. Is that yeah. the reality? It is reality. Um, you know, because 
we, the things that we're passionate about is the things that we put our time in. And growing up, I didn't have a big family. I, do, I wasn't close to my other family members. And I even remember being in the park and this kid asked like, oh, are all these brothers and sisters? Because there was a lot of kids there. And I was like, no, it's just me and my sister. And I was kind of down on that. And my mom heard it and she, she grabbed me and she was like, what was that? Are, do you wish you had more brothers and sisters? And I was like, yeah, I do. And growing up, I always wanted to make sure that I had like a healthy family, um, you know, good relationship with my wife, but then also like spending as much time as possible. I didn't want to miss out on moments with my kids. And, um, you know, the life as an administrator, as you know, Dave, is, is hard because we have to spend a lot of time away um, because we have long hours. And so, you know, the days where I have to go and, you know, go to a board meeting or go to a, a game and, and be the admin on duty when I have to come home at nine, 10 at night and I don't get to see them, like I, that kills me. Um, so yeah, I'm extremely proud of my family. I'm extremely proud of, of trying to balance as much as I can. Um, I'm not perfect by any means. I, I have definitely things I need to improve on um, as far as making sure that I schedule my time appropriately to, to make sure that I'm there and present at all times. But um, yeah, it's definitely a goal and something I've always wanted. So are, are you fully extended right now? I mean, five kids, yes. podcast, <laughs> podcast network, writing. I mean, so there's yes. nothing like you're not thinking right now, oh, there's one more thing I wish I could do right now. Not right now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> not right now. I am book solid. <laughs> so so let's, let's break down some of the things that you're doing. And then I'm going to circle back to the, sure. the fatherhood thing. The, the fatherhood thing is something I want to really latch on to and dive deep on. But I want to cover yeah. some of these other things first. Um, let's, let's talk first school administration. How, how did you step into that? There's really, I, I, see, I see leaders that embark on their leadership journey one of two ways. They either look themselves in the mirror and say, yep, I'm a leader. I have something that I can do to support schools and districts and, and people. Or people that are just, they've got their head down, they're doing their thing, and somebody comes up to them and taps them on the shoulder and they say, I see leadership potential in you. Which of those two are you or are you something completely different? No, I wish I could say it was the first, but I was too young. Um, I was definitely the second. Um, it was my third year as a teacher. Um, I had just started coaching and honestly, it was amazing to, to start coaching again. I, I began my journey um, actually as a graphic designer. And then when I went back to school, I started coaching soccer and it was a paraprofessional. But when I moved to Texas and became an art teacher, I just wanted to focus on teaching. I didn't want to do anything else because I just want to focus on my craft to make sure I was doing a good job. And so my third year, I got the opportunity to then coach um, again. And so I got to coach football, basketball, and track. And it gave me this whole opportunity to be a part of a campus beyond my classroom. And within a couple months of being a coach, my assistant principal did tap me on my shoulder and, and said, hey, have you ever thought about doing administration? Hmm. And I laughed at him. I was in the break room just trying to get some coffee. And I was like, no way. Like, I, I'm just trying to figure out how to be a teacher and now be a coach. And he's like, no, man, like there are other people on this campus that already have their principal certificate, but I think you have the most potential to actually move on to the next level. And so um, I respected him so much. And, and I took that to heart, came back and talked to my wife. And I was like, Leslie, what are we going to do? Like, is this something even plausible? Because, you know, I was doing all those other things too. I mean, as you know, as a coach, you're gone. I was gone four or five nights a week. And I was like, how can I throw a master's program in on that? And so um, it was not easy. It was not easy. Um, those two or you know, the 18 months, two years was insane. I didn't see her a ton. I didn't see the kids a ton. Um, I just was like, Hey, this is our Valley. I'm going to hunker down and get it done. And so um, yeah, three years later, I was a Dean of students um, and, and began my administrative duties. So yeah, it was, it was not easy, um, but that conversation was a total life changer for me. Um, definitely was a crossroads at that time. Um, I was just really just trying to figure out what teaching and coaching was. <laughs> I wasn't really thinking about leadership. Now, is that, and I'm just going to jump right into the fatherhood thing. It, it, it sounds to me, I'm wondering, I shouldn't say it sounds to me, I'm wondering, was that conversation that you had about going into leadership similar to the conversations that you guys had about having more kids? Um, you know, where you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm already kind of busy, but we're at this crossroads. But here's what I kind of wanted to do. It's going to be exhausting. It's going to be busy. We're going to be pulling our hair out at times, but it will be worth it. Yeah. So we're, we're people of service. Like, you know, I'm in education. Yeah. I serve kids. She's a nurse. She serves people in the medical field. And so that just was something that we decided to do. Um, we're people of faith. We're at church. We heard a, a sermon. 
um, about adoption. There, the sermon was on adoption overseas, and that was actually what we thought about. Um, but then we had some friends that um, adopted through foster care, and we started to look into the adoption process. And I don't know if you've ever looked into it, but it's crazy expensive. Mm-hmm. Like we, we are not rich by any means. Um, that was just it. That wasn't possible. It was just out of our budget. So um, when we found out that foster care and there's thousands of kids in our backyard um, that need homes, it it was it just struck our heart like we need to do something. We didn't know what it was, but we knew we need to do something. So um, yes, we knew it wasn't going to be easy. You know, we had conversations with family members, and some of them were like, "Are you are you sure? <laughs> do you know what you're getting into?" Um, and they almost were trying to sway us the other way of not doing it. And we're like, no, we just feel called to do this. This is something we, we really want to explore. And honestly, it was the best thing. It's been such a blessing for our family. Um, beyond, I could even tell you in the short time that we have, but it, it's been a phenomenal journey for sure. So I, I'm, I'm curious about this because, you know, I've, I've already got four kids, but I have actually thought about fostering and or going down the adoption process. But mm-hmm. a fear that I have is what will that do to disrupt what I currently have. And I know that's a selfish lens to look through, but it's, it is a real thought. Has, did that thought ever cross your mind of, and we, we kind of have it good right now, what will this do to change that dynamic? Yeah, there's always fear of the unknown, right? I mean, you, sure. you don't know what you don't know. And so we also didn't know what was the long-term effects on our own biological children. Sure. You know, would yeah. they feel less loved? Would they feel like we were spending too much time with people um, that weren't, quote unquote, our, our biological children. And I can tell you that was not our experience. It was the opposite. You know, when our kids talk now about being an adult, they're not talking about how many bio kids they're talking about, how many bio kids and how many adopted kids they're going to have. Wow. You know, they're talking about service um, beyond that. Um, so, you know, the, it's just a part of their life. You know, those, you just never know, of course, you know, when you get into it, but now looking back, um, it's been an incredible thing for them to see, you know, our, and not, again, we're not perfect, but at least they saw a model, right. Of someone going out and, and trying to help someone else, even though technically they're not blood, but I can assure you that every kid in our house, you know, they are, they are blood, you know, they may look different. You know, we have black and brown children in our house beyond my white skin, um, but that doesn't matter. Like mm. their family. So um, yeah, it's been an amazing experience. What, what has been the biggest obstacle you've had to overcome in all this? Because it seems like your heart and your mind are made up and you're good to go. And you're looking at it saying, we know this is right for us. We recognize mm-hmm. what other people might think and they might perceive, but this is right for us. What, what's yeah. been the biggest struggle that you've had to overcome throughout all of this? Well, we've had, we've had kids leave us. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you, you go into this and when they train you as a foster parent, they always say the goal is that it is the child goes back to the parents. And I believe that 100%. However, <laughs> with the human heart, we get attached easily. And as much as we tried to put walls up, um, we, we did have one child where, you know, we were ready to adopt. The process looked like that was going to happen. And um, last second, um, the child actually was taken um, from us to um, go somewhere else. Um, I won't go into details, but, um, you know, we had a name, we had a crib, we had everything, right? Um, it, it seemed like a, a slam dunk. And that wasn't the case. And I remember getting that phone call at, at work and um, Leslie was crying and she was like, you know, they're coming to pick up the baby. And I was like, whoa, what? And so I ran into my principal's office. I was like, I got to go. And I didn't even tell her why. I just, she just knew. <laughs> so I jumped in my car. And as soon as I got um, in front of the house, the, the baby was being put in the back seat. Um, and so I got to say goodbye for the last time. But Um, we actually stepped away for about six months from foster care because that just broke our hearts. Um, and we recovered and, you know, after that we, we got several placements that, you know, we eventually adopted, but uh, at that time that was, that was pretty painful. Wow. Now, are you still in the, the, the fostering system? So you still bring kids through the house? Wow. Okay. Yep. And, and yeah. So right now we're open, we're open. Um, so, you know, we can get a call any day <laughs> and they could say, you know, uh, there's a kid available. So, and, yes. and do you have the ability to say, sorry, the, there's no room at the inn, or do you take them in? How, yes. how does that work? Yeah. So they, you know, you don't always get the most accurate information. Um, <laughs> sometimes you don't know the gender or the race or anything like that. Um, sometimes the age is a little bit off too. Um, but 
because of Leslie's background, we can also take uh, medical children. So um, mm -hmm. children that have some um, medical needs. And so sometimes those needs are greater than what we can take at this time. So um, we have said no to several kids lately anyways that have been pretty high needs um, and something where we would have to actually have someone at the hospital for a long, you know, extended period of time. Mm. And um, just where we are in life, we just, we couldn't say yes to that. It wouldn't be fair um, to anyone, not our family, not to the, the new child. So we have said no. Mm. Mm. Uh, you're just, you're blowing me away again with that, that humility and that, that servant heart that you have. Um, I, I don't know if anybody else listening picked up on the fact that you, you keep saying we get to, we get to it as though you're the one that's receiving the blessing from all of this. It's not like you're going about it with this savior mentality. You're seeing the benefits to yourself. You're feeling, do you feel like this has enhanced your life experience as well? Oh, yes. Yes. I mean, I, I truly believe that we should not be living in comfortable lives. Like we have, especially in our country, we, we are abundantly <laughs> provided to. Um, and there are so many kids, and you see this too in the schools that are really going through extremely tough times at home and they don't deserve that, right? They deserve to be safe and they deserve to be loved on. And um, our heart breaks when that doesn't occur as an educator. And so as a, as a father, if I can offer that up to another child um, to provide that um, so that they have a better life moving forward, like why wouldn't I give that a shot, right? So um, yes, we, we feel extremely blessed because, you know, coming home to a bunch of kids, you know, with smiles and running and grabbing your leg and saying that they love you. I mean, what an amazing feeling. So um, they, they fill my cup every single day. That's incredible. It's incredible. And yet you're still finding the time to, like you said, do multiple podcasts and to now <laughs> lead an entire podcast network. Can you talk to me about where your podcast came from in all of this? Because you were, uh, you stepped into leadership because somebody else saw it in you. You um, are just this amazing servant parent. And now you're paying all of this forward by taking your voice, your wisdom, your words, those of the other people that you, that you talk to and speak to and sharing that with the masses. It's almost like this model just continues to replicate itself over and over and over again in your life and in your work. Where did you get the idea to, to start the, the podcasting game and to move that forward? Sure. So I think my fourth year in administration, I started to, um, the district actually asked a bunch of us to start a cadre for aspiring leaders. And so we built this program to allow people and not that they were going in administration, but maybe they want to be counselors, the administrators, whatever. Um, we gave them an opportunity to get out of their classroom and experience leadership in different ways. And so we tried to give them simulations almost, and we had guest speakers and we had all these different things. And um, we had such great feedback that the district after the second year, they actually took it away and they, they built their own with the district leaders. And so um, the year after that, I was just longing to help aspiring leaders. And so um, I was a part of a principal association for the district and I put on a one night deal for just aspiring leaders, just a program. And I didn't really advertise it a ton. I just tried to throw it together as quickly as possible. And we had 175 people show up <laughs> and it was just this, this huge event. And we did something similar um, with like simulations. And then I had a panel of administrators and um, people were just like, they just wanted information. They were like sponges and the energy level that night. And so after that, I was like, I have to do something like there's obviously a need here. I don't know what that is, but I got to give something to these folks. And so then I was like, well, if I have 175 in this district, in my district, what does that look like in the state of Texas? What does that look like in the United States? What does that look like around the world? And not everyone has a mentor on their campus. Not everyone has someone to guide them. And so if they don't have that, where are they getting that information? Um, my good friend, Todd Nesloni was doing the Kids Deserve It um, mm -hmm. podcast at the time. I went and visited him at his campus and I just happened to walk into his office and he was doing it and he was doing it through YouTube um, at the time with Adam Welcome. And um, I was just sitting there and just watching and just kind of taking mental notes and he made it look so easy. Of course, now looking back, it's because he's just brilliant, but um, 
when he was done, I was laughing. I was like, that looks easy. Like, what if I did that? And he's like, you should. And I was, and I kind of just said it out just facetiously, like, whatever, like just maybe. And then a couple of months later, I was really thinking about it even more about aspiring leadership and, and doing a podcast for that. And so I was picking his mind, really digging at him about the process. And that's really where it came from. Um, I was going to do, I was reached out to Jeff Veal um, with uh, lead up chat. He's a good friend. He lives not too far from me. And we were actually talking about doing aspiring leadership um, at the, as like co-host. Um, but we just couldn't get our schedules. And I was like, Jeff, I can't wait any longer. I got to do it. <laughs> I'm just going to go with it. And uh, he gave me his blessing. And that's where Aspire came from. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so at what point do you feel like you will have capitalized on, on that moment and met your goal? Is it when you know that administrators around the world are tapped into this? Or are you, are you there now? And I, I say that because you, you talk about Todd and how he made it just look so easy. That's kind of how I feel when I, when I listen to you and when I watch you do the work, you make it look so easy and it's almost like you've hit your rhythm right now, but I know that you've got goals and you keep, cause you keep hustling, you keep going, you keep growing. So what is that, that end goal for the podcast for you? I honestly, I don't know. Um, you know, I just, that's kind of what's fun about life. I, I never dreamed about being an assistant principal. I hated school growing up. Like <laughs> If you would have told me that as a 14 year old, I would have laughed and like, you're crazy um, to say that I would have a podcast. Like I, I didn't even know what a podcast was, you know, seven years ago. Mm. Um, I was, I was barely on Twitter. So, you know, just every, every year, I just feel like there's something new uh, writing a book. I don't like to write. <laughs> I, it's, I like to talk. I don't like to write. Um, so if you would have told me I was writing a book, I would have told you you're insane. So, um, you know, I like challenging myself. I like um, not knowing what the future holds and I just want to serve. And so I don't feel like I'm done serving um, in any way. And I don't feel like I've, like, I do feel like I've hit my stride a little bit as far as I'm feeling comfortable and um, I've got this good rhythm going. Um, I feel much more comfortable in interviews than ever before, but I don't, I'm not done. <laughs> so to answer your question, I don't really have a goal. I just, I just enjoy this process a lot and I feel like I'm helping people. And if yeah. I'm helping people, then I should continue to do it. And, and you definitely are. You know, one of the things we talked about early on is how you've got your own podcast, but now it's, it's grown and you are now the director of an entire podcast network and you're wearing the shirt right now too, the, the yeah. teach better, the, the teach better podcast network, which is, again, it's, it's your work, but you're, it's not your podcast necessarily. I mean, you've got shows there, but it's, you're now yeah. able to take your wisdom, your knowledge, your experience and help amplify other voices again in this bigger, more grandiose way. It reminds me of what you talked about with, with your kids and how your kids see their future family looking a lot like your family right now. And mm -hmm. you've kind of redefined what's possible and what is normal. And I feel like you're kind of doing that with this podcast network as well. You've kind of gone through the, the fires a little bit. You've learned it. You've grown it. And now you're able to share that with others so other people can see those possibilities of what's, what, is, what the potential is. So can you talk yeah. about this, this podcast network with people that are like, a podcast network? What is that? I mean, is this like Netflix for podcasts? I mean, <laughs> how does it work? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> kind I don't of know, building it as we go, go right? Like. Yeah, we're, we're building it as we go, right? So that's how that's what I like. Um, so I've other other podcasts have been, and you know, maybe it's business, maybe it's um, athletics. You know, there's actually I, I like athletics a lot. In fact, I was watching the NBA Finals before where I jumped on with you, but um, I get a lot of inspiration from listening to other podcasts, but mostly athletic podcasts like the yeah. sports world, and um, so hearing a, a network, a podcast network, um, that was like, wow, what if we did that in the educational space? And so talking with Jeff Gargas of teach better, you know, we, we've been throwing this around a little bit, um, of like, what does that look like? And so what we're trying to do is to build a collection of just amazing podcasts that hit a wide range. So, um, no matter what you're looking for, whatever your needs are, you can come to the podcast network and you can find it there. Um, and hopefully you can grow with each, you know, different podcast. And so the network is just a collection of these, these phenomenal people, including you, Dave, um, that just bring so much value, inspiration um, to our educators and to our listeners. And so 
Um, I don't know the future as far as what that looks like, but right now we're just building, right? Uh, we started with eight podcasts. We just signed four more, so that we're going to be up to 12 um, of just some phenomenal um, shows. So yeah, I, I don't know where it's going, but I know that it's serving people and, yeah. and I'm excited about it. I love that. And just to, to kind of give the analogy to people, to people of network, if you think about network TV, you know, NBC mm -hmm. back 10 years ago, NBC had the nightly news and Dateline, but they also housed the office. They've had yep. friends. They've, they've, they've got oh, days of our lives, whatever. I mean, it's a wide collection of shows that you can watch on NBC, but they're all housed under the Peacock and the Peacock yep. vets them and supports them, but they've got, they've, they've all got their own publisher, um, producers, their own directors, their own yeah. actors, but yet they're all kind of within the same brand. And I kind of feel like that's yeah. what, what the teach better podcast network is as well. Everybody's got their own independent voice, their own yes. flair. It's not a rinse and repeat of a bunch of the same shows. It's mm -hmm. everybody doing their own thing, but we all have your support. And you talk about Jeff Gargas and, Ray Hewitt, Chad, we've got the support of, and everybody else, these now 12 shows can all um, lean into each other and grow and inspire each other, which is, which is phenomenal. So, so good. I mean, maybe that's your life's work. Maybe your life's work is just to be this connector of people. You are to bring in people and say, let's all become one family together. You're, you're like the godfather of education almost. <laughs> <laughs> you're giving me too much credit, Dave. <laughs> No, but I love the connection piece. I, I do. That's that's part of what I love about the the Teach Better Network uh, podcast network is I get a lot of conversations with different educators, and you know we're growing together as far as you know behind the scenes of you know what are you doing yeah. with your podcast that's different maybe from what your you know your procedure and process or equipment, and you know we're learning from each other in the behind the scenes too. So um, you know the people that are in the network they're they're growing. Um, as far as their craft with the podcast, whereas the listeners are hopefully grown from, you know, the insights and inspiration from the guests. Oh, that's cool, man. You're again, you're just doing it all. So let's talk about the, the last of the projects that I've mentioned, which is this book, because as if you're not doing enough already, and now you're doing something that you admitted you don't even like to do, but you said, yeah, <laughs> let me do it. Why not? So you're writing a book now. Why? And what do we have to look forward to? Yeah. So the why, yeah, it, I wanted to challenge myself. It is something that I've thought about for a long time and, and something that I've wanted to do just to say that I, I can do it right. To prove to myself. Um, there's a lot of things that I've done to prove other people wrong and, and <laughs> to prove myself wrong. Um, like I said, I hated school. Um, but I wasn't really inspired to move forward in my education until a counselor told me I couldn't do it. And then I was like, game on. And not only did I, you know, graduate high school, I got into the college. I, I told him I was going to, you know, I wanted to get into, and he told me I couldn't get into, and I graduated within four years. Hold on. Um, you went to Michigan? <laughs> no, oh, that's not where you wanted buddy. to go. <laughs> Bethel University. And, um, and not only did I graduate, but then I went back to, you know, get my teaching cert certificate through there too. So, um, or like my varsity coach cut me my senior year from the soccer team. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm not done. And then I lettered my freshman year of college. Wow. So like there's things in my life where I, I like to, I like to challenge <laughs> and I like to prove people wrong. Um, throughout my life, English was not my strong suit. And I was told over and over, I was not a good writer. And over time, I feel like I've tried to hone in on that craft. Mm. And so I've, I've had to get through that hurdle. Um, and mostly I don't like it because I have to battle myself about um, the product and if it's good enough. And so um, thankfully, I have, like I said, my amazing wife here um, to help me and, and to give me the confidence moving forward. But all that being said is the book is, is coincides with my, my podcast. So it's for aspiring leaders. It's called aspire to lead. And I have um, amazing uh, contributors, former guests. And so in the book, um, there's other voices in there too. And then I'll also have links back to the podcast. So it's an additional resource within the book. Um, but really the book's all about the, the word aspire and using that as a, a, a model. So it's, you know, activate, support, persevere, identify, reflect, and execute. And using those words to really help guide people. And no matter if you want to be an administrator, a counselor, um, a district administrator, whatever your path may be, using those words to help you within your journey 
um, to make sure that you're being successful. And so I go through a lot of my failures. <laughs> I go through um, a lot of things that I've struggled with as a teacher moving into the administrative world and hopefully using that as a guide to um, make sure that they're not falling in those same landmines that I did and, and to make sure that they're having a, a smoother transition into leadership. Well, I'll be honest with you. You say this book is filled with your failures. I imagine this being a short, short read then. I mean, it's got to just be two or three pages long because I'm listening to your story and I don't see those missteps. I hear a guy that says, all right, I want that challenge. Got it. I'm going to go get it. I, I want another challenge. Boom. I'm just going to go. It's almost like you just self-talk yourself into um, success. It, is, <laughs> is, is, that, is it not that easy for you where you just say, it's yeah, I want, I want to go do this. Let's go do this. I want more kids. Let's get more kids. I want a new job. I'm going to get a new job. I want a podcast. Boom. A book. Let's do it. I, you're not a genie. <laughs> It's not that way. Yeah. So, you know, every, every single thing that you said, that is something that has taken years, right? Mm. So um, I, you know, the book was something that has taken years. Um, the podcast, you know, I've been doing that for two and a half years now. Um, before, you know, I went through the administrative process of trying to be a dean of students from as a teacher. And I actually went through, got to the last round and failed miserably in my last interview. Um, and they told me I wasn't even ready to be an administrator. And so um, within the educational field, of course, I have to wait for a whole rent school year sure. <laughs> to even get the opportunity to interview again. And so, you know, I talk about that process. So even, you know, being a leader, because you have to understand I was a teacher and a coach in my classroom. I didn't really go beyond that. I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't even have a leadership title when I got tapped on the shoulder. So I went from this new teacher in the art room, again, I was an art teacher, so people had their own perceptions of what that was, <laughs> to all of a sudden I was in everything. Mm. And there, there was a lot of pushback of where did this guy come from? He doesn't even know what he's doing in his classroom, let alone lead a building. So um, I talk about you know trying to, that's the identify chapter is really trying to figure out like who are you as a leader? Um, so that way you can take that identity and be successful outside of your classroom. So yeah, there were definitely some, some trials and tribulations and, and that process was about two and a half years before I actually got the administrative role. I got, I, I'm super excited to read this book, just putting that out there. I feel like there are a ton of educational books out there right now, but the vast majority are books of people who say, here's what worked for me, rinse and repeat, cut and paste, copy it, follow my footsteps and do what I did and it'll work for you. What, what intrigues me about your book is it's a book. It sounds like it's saying, here's what I did. Don't do that. Do, you know, it's a, I wish I would have dot, mm -hmm. dot, dot. And Oh, that, that vulnerability, um, that humility is it's exciting and it's refreshing. And I'm, I'm excited to read it. Cause I feel like we're going to get to really get inside of you because I think a lot of people do look at you and say, wow, you are successful. You are that guy who's living the life I want to eventually get to, whether it's all being as busy as you are, or just having that peace and that contentment that you seem to have. I mean, I'll, I've said it and I'll say it again. That's what I long for. I long for having that satisfaction that you have. So if that means I have to just peel back the, the layers or a page <laughs> at a time to figure out what's going on to get closer to that, I'm all for it. But when are you, when are you thinking this is going to be out? Is it still in process? Are we looking 20, the year 2021 or are we looking tomorrow? Yes. Yeah. No, I wish tomorrow. No, I got some, I got a couple of chapters I got to finish. Um, and you know, trying to get those contributions in. So, yeah. um, I'm hoping to, to turn in everything, you know, at the end of this year and then 2021 will be when it releases. Oh, I can't wait. 2021 is going to be an epic year. <laughs> I think everybody is saying that. <laughs> Let's get past this year and it's going to be a brand yes. new start. And it's going to be a great way to, to live 21. I can't wait, man. Yes, I can't wait. So, so Josh, we've, we've covered a lot of stuff, man. We've talked about fatherhood. We've talked balance. We've talked leadership, podcasting and logistics behind that. I mean, we've talked about a lot of things right now. And with, with my episodes, I always try to, to sum it up and say, and there's a, people are listening to a lot of things right now. And they've got a lot of ideas and sparks going. But if you were on stage right now delivering this as a speech and you had that mic in your hand and you had the opportunity to say one more thing before you drop that mic and walk off the stage that people are going to hold on to and say, wow, Josh would just deliver that. Or if they're driving to work right now, they're going to pull over in the Rite Aid parking lot and really zone in and listen to this. 
What is that thing that you want people to take out of your story, your life, your message? What, what is that mic drop moment that you have? Well, I want, I want folks to hone in on what's important in their life and then hold on to that dearly. Because, you know, a lot of people say, I don't have time. But then when they really break down where they put their time within their day, they're going to realize that there's a lot of time that goes to things that are not important. And when we are able to be in a reflective and vulnerable place, I think that's when we can actually put our time where it really needs to go. And I say that because everyone needs to have a passion project. You know, I, I have the Aspire podcast, I have Teach Better, and I have things that I can feed into. But I've feel like a lot of people get burnt out in the educational field because they don't have anything to pour into mm -hmm. that they truly are passionate about. And so if you're out there and you're listening and you just are not, you're not feeling it right now. And I can understand in 2020 <laughs> how you got there. Um, but you need to find something that is something you can step away from that is not a part of the job that you're passionate about and that you can feed into. Yes. Um, so I, I call that the passion project. So if you don't have a passion project, you need to find it tomorrow, whatever that may be. And you need to fill your cup <laughs> with that. Now that doesn't mean, you know, get away from your family and don't spend time with them to work on your passion project, mm -hmm. but it means really reflecting on the time that you're providing within your day and make sure that you're going to that project every single day to at least, even if it's five minutes, 10 minutes, I promise you it's going to be fulfilling in your life and it's going to give you energy to then go back to the job the next day. Could not agree more, man. I, I'm a firm believer that podcasts, blogs, and all the educational books out right, out right now have saved education, not because of all the yes. wisdom, but simply because we have so many teachers now saying, okay, that's going to be my outlet. I would be totally content if we had 3 million podcasts out there, 3 million educational books, because every single teacher was saying, I'm going to do this just so my voice can be out there, just so that I can express myself, just so I can have some sanity. If that's what it's going to take mm -hmm. to keep teachers in the classroom, keep administrators leading, I am all for it, man. That, that's great wisdom. Find a passion project, latch on to it, keep your focus, your focus, and build around that. Yep. I love it. I love it. Love it. Man, Josh, thank you again. Um, it, on that note, for, for taking time out of your schedule, I know you don't have a lot of free time, and we scheduled this in the middle of what could be a clinching basketball game right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, all right, man, I'll make time for you, Schmidt, whatever. But, but no, I appreciate man. it. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a sponge to all things that you do. And just being able to sit down and, and talk across the table or across the country through a computer screen, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I am personally grateful. And I know the listeners have gained some wisdom from, from you as well. So I appreciate you carving out some time so that I could feed my own passions. <laughs> Dave, this is a true honor. Honestly, it, I would rather be here than watch the NBA finals. That's how much <laughs> I, that's how much you, your friendship means to me. And um, I, it is a true honor to be on your show. Oh man, I, I appreciate it. So just last, last thing, it'll be in the show notes and all, all of the places, but we have some people out there that are kind of lazy and we don't like to, to go down and, and scroll through. <laughs> Tell people where can they find your stuff and how can they connect with you? Sure. So on Twitter, Instagram, I'm Joshua double underscore stamper. And then my website is joshstamper.com. And on the website, you can find absolutely everything. You can find my blog, you can find the podcast, all my social media outlets, everything. There you go. So connect with this guy. He will fill you up. He'll inspire you and he'll get you better tomorrow than you are today, man. So Follow him. And again, Joshua, I appreciate you. Now go watch some basketball. I sure will. <laughs> Thanks, Dave.